The traditional Israeli military doctrine has been escalation dominant, so that if you punch Israel in the face, all right, they will punch back twice as hard. Then Iran sent a, a fleet of, of missiles and drones to attack Israel, and Israel's response was incredibly mild. So Israel has shifted away from escalation dominance, which has been its long-term, uh, long-time military strategy. And that, that's curious, right? Hezbollah is lobbing rockets over into northern Israel, and yet uh, the Israeli military response has been relatively mild compared to what you would expect. So there has been a shift away from the, the number one Israeli military doctrine of escalation dominance. All right, who, who determines the, the winning narrative? And one of my favorite bloggers is Andrew Gelman, who is a statistics professor at Columbia University. And he, he was trying to work out why was the nudge phenomenon so popular, right? So the nudge phenomenon is if you just rig incentives a little bit and start nudging people to do the right thing, that this will produce big effects. And so nudge became a cool unifying slogan that connected academic research to public policy. So you had more money and more jobs flowing into academia and you had the opportunity to change the world and to gain more prestige, power and income for yourself, right? So nudge became an academic success and a political success, even though the evidence for it was virtually non-existent. And the success of the nudge story is the same of a lot of other stories, says Andrew Gelman, when the story becomes a story. So in the 1990s, Michael Jordan's success became the story. And uh, with Tiger Woods and Bill Gates, their success became the story. So when something gets big enough, its success becomes part of the story and takes on a power of its own, right? Think about Brexit, Black Lives Matter, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, the story becomes the story. Something big is happening and people want to join in. Uh, one friend recommended to me the works of Hayden White, who was a historiographer of the 1980s, and he popularized the idea of meta history. And so he would say that uh, that narratives would appeal to precognitive ways of seeing the world, right? So before we think about things, we, we feel things through. And those narratives are most successful that appeal to our biologically predisposed precognitive ways of, of seeing the world. And historians who align with these precognitive ways of seeing the world will create narratives that are more successful. And Hayden White says this whole process of creating narrative history is a subconscious desire to turn a meaningless reality into an imaginary order of coherence and integrity. So from a secular perspective, our need for a hero system is a way to turn meaningless reality into an imaginary order of coherence and integrity where we get to play an important role. I'm thinking about the day that John F. Kennedy was assassinated, right? Two of the greatest new journalists of the 1960s went out into Manhattan on the orders of their editors to, to get the story. But the story that they brought back did not fit in with the prevailing narrative. And so both their pieces were rejected. So in his 1979 book, The Right Stuff, right, Tom Wolfe uses the concept of a discreet, hypocritical Victorian gentleman to symbolize the press. So instead of giving its readers the whole story, the press acting as one giant entity decide what the public must know and then delivers it, edited and retouched to perfection. So the news media in America, for all its vaunted independence, is really a great colonial animal, an animal made up of countless clustered organisms responding to a central nervous system. And this animal seems determined in all matters of national importance that there is one proper emotion, there is one seemly sentiment, there is one fitting moral tone that should be established and must prevail, and all information that muddies this tone and weakens this feeling should simply be thrown down the memory. And so on the day of John F. Kennedy's assassination, Tom Wolfe went to Little Italy, and everybody thought that their natural enemies had done the assassination of John F. Kennedy. Right? The Italians didn't like the Jews, so they blamed it on the Jews. The Jews blamed it on the Chinese. The Chinese blamed it on the Italians. And Tom Wolfe says, I thought these stories were hilarious, but when I got back to the newspaper, I'm sitting there looking for my piece, and it's not there. All they wanted was little old ladies collapsing in front of St. Patrick's Cathedral. That was it. They didn't want any turmoil in the population over who did it. Newspapers are the last redoubt of people who want to observe the niceties. Something big happens, and whatever the proper reaction should be, that's what you get in the news media. And uh, Tom Wolfe 
I believe correctly, sees individuals primarily as representatives of their group. So the perspective of liberalism is that individuals are primarily individuals who are born with certain inalienable rights. The traditional way of viewing people is that they are primarily members of a group. Right? So the Italians blame the Jews who blame the Chinese. People, individuals are first and foremost a member of a group, a race, a tribe, a class, a certain stratum of society. And so Tom Wolf would look at the, the vertical line of individual psychology as intersecting with the broad plane of society. And nobody can be a true individual because whatever you want to be is going to be pushed around and changed by the, your group's hero system. A gay Talese went out on the day of Kennedy's assassination. He spent several hours with Tom Wolf going from downtown Manhattan, Wall Street, Chinatown, Little Italy. Then we came uptown. We walked around the theater district in the West 40s, uptown toward Columbus Circles. And I didn't see much reaction at all to the assassination from New Yorkers. I didn't see anybody crying in the streets. I didn't overhear anybody lamenting aloud about the fatal shooting in Dallas. People heard the news over the radio. People were talking about the vent among themselves as they waited for a traffic light on the street corner. But there was absolutely no sign of the Bonfort masses that would be the signature image on TV. And after I reported what I had seen in New York, the editor did not want me to write anything because what I had seen or not seen did not conform to the expected or ideal response the situation seemed to call for, at least in the editor's eyes. So there was no story in the Times by me that day, nor was there anything by Tom Wolf in the New York Herald Tribune. We could not publish what we saw because we didn't see what our editors so, and who determined that Dallas in 1963 was the city of right-wing hate, and that was a dominant prism through which to understand the Kennedy assassination that was carried out by a communist. Right, so Larry McInerney, the former director of the University of Chicago writing program, right, he says that knowledge uh, refers to conversations that are, that are moving through time. And that horrifies you. Why would those people get to say? Why did they get to say? Especially because, historically, of course, they've looked just like me. <laughs> As my niece says to me every time she sees me, too male, too pale, too stale. <laughs> Why on earth would these people get to say what knowledge is? I get it. I get it. Big problem. But they do. And that's a fact. These people get to say what counts as knowledge. The good news is they are changing. Way too long, way too late, way too slow, but they're changing. But the point is, that's the way it works. You may not like it, but that's the way it works. They get to say. So they get to say, yep, you're right. That was new. I didn't know how many people were in 302. But it doesn't count as knowledge. It doesn't have any value to us. It doesn't count. The good news is, this thing just moved, does move through time. The other good news is, this boundary is permeable.